them alive by Pierce Nace read by Al Richardson Chapter 9 For a few seconds the man and the beast faced each other, their eyes wide, their hands moving, their wariness showing. Dyke thought, he remembers me all right. If I had a hind quarter of a butchered animal to offer him, I might get by. But he's eaten every bite on the boat. There's no meat left for him but me. Why didn't I tie up one of the natives and leave him on deck to be this beast's meal? Slayer came across the room and paused in the doorway beside Dyke. He extended his clawed hands as he'd done in the jungle when he wanted food, when Dyke had always been able to supply it. But this time Dyke's hands were empty. Slayer's bright protruding eyes went up and down his master's person, as if searching for the hunger appeasement that was not visible. Dyke argued smoothly, softly. Slayer, my good friend, you, you aren't hungry. You can't be. You've eaten everything I had on this boat, and I had a lot. You're full. And you want to go ashore with me, get reacquainted with your old buddies, the mantises we left on Malpello. He knew the mantis could not understand his words, but they were reassuring to himself. And he hoped that his soft voice, his coaxing tone so packed with affection, would hold the beast from making Dyke the meal he sought. But the monster began waving his clawed hands and shuffling his tremendous feet, his jaws working harder and harder with every breath. Dyke's odour did not seem to repel him as it did at first. Perhaps it had been a mistake for Dyke to accustom the mantis to his smell and thus teach him to ignore its unsavouriness. He stepped back through the door. Slayer stepped with him. But the monster was closer to the man now, near enough to take a bite if he so desired. And evidently, that was exactly what he meant to do. The beast's eyes were on Dyke's feet and ankles, which gleamed bare and brown in the sunlight that danced upon the sea. Dyke thought, God, I forgot that the water could wash off my covering. I put it on my skin and clothes too, but I lost it when I waded to the island, then back to the boat. God, my feet and ankles don't smell bad at all. Not like the rest of me. Will Slayer bite off my legs and feet and devour them before my eyes? He held himself taut and tried to keep backing away. But the mantis caught him before he'd gained the stairs. One of the great claws flashed out, caught the top of Dyke's denim pants, his only garment, and ripped them from him. In the next second the beast was standing over him as he knocked him to the deck. He did not offer to bite him. Would the smell save Dyke after all? Yet he knew he dared not be too hopeful. There was eating, killing in Slayer's eyes. The beast suddenly turned from the man's face and from his body, as far as the knees, seeming not to want to risk the foul taste for the meal beneath it. But his eyes went down and spied Dyke's ankles and feet, Dyke thought, God, if you're going to bite them off, do it fast, damn fast, before I lose my cool. Then, like a bolt of electricity shot between the poles, the great thing dropped its head and opened its jaws. In a second, it had bitten out the hole of Dyke's left calf, leaving the bone exposed, the flesh torn and bleeding, the blood from the man's veins rushing into the wrecked galley and dying them both. 
But as Slayer sat back upon his haunches to enjoy his new-found meat, Dyke slid swiftly out of the door and slammed it after him, turning the key in the lock, breathing with relief as he found himself free at last. God, that, that thing would have eaten him, up to his knees if he'd stayed there. Slayer would have found out that there was meat and blood under the frightful smell and he'd have dug out Dyke's insides, eating them a bite at a time. God, watching a beast bite off part of you and chew it up before your face and eyes was a, was a torture he'd never known before. Stabbing was painful, being shot, that was hell. But being eaten, bite by bite, seeing your own blood gush from your veins and redden the floor at your feet, that... That was the ultimate torture. He knew how his old enemies would suffer, as they were slit to bits, as they were devoured in pieces, as they died when their living hearts were torn from them. Dyke looked down at his wounded leg, still bleeding profusely where the calf had been. There was no pain now, as there would have been when Slayer took his big bite. There was only numbness, but Dyke knew the pain would return, would plague him for days and weeks as the wound healed. He ran upstairs to the rail, grabbed one of the towels he kept there and made a tourniquet. He tied it tightly below his left knee. The flow of blood lessened somewhat and he stood up. Though it was not easy, he could keep walking. There were no broken bones to prevent it. His eyes followed the trail of blood he'd made from the galley up the stairs to where he stood now. He'd witnessed countless people and animals drained of their blood by the mantises, without repulsion or regret. It had been pure enjoyment to him, but the sight of his own blood was frustrating and infuriating. He must ensure it's not happening again. Nothing must stand in the way of his plans. In his death there could be no vengeance. He must not allow any beast to eat any part of him any more. He moved to the medicine chest which he always stored behind an iron panel. He took down alcohol and cleansed the wound where the mantis's sharp teeth, well, fangs really, from the way they'd bitten into his leg and defleshed it in one bite, had left their mark. Then he poured his special concoction into the hole in his leg, a medicine that had healed cuts and bruises all these years, had even saved him from the infection of a puma's bite once. He wrapped the leg around and round with a clean cloth, last he smeared the cloth with his jungle potion, giving it the same smell as the rest of his body. If he could find something for Slayer to eat, both here and on the island, he would be ready to take his chief mantis ashore. He raised his binoculars, studied the sea of moving, writhing green upon the isle. Though the mount of mantis carcasses was higher than a second-storey window now. Though the other side of the island was filled with more green husks of beasts and washing out to sea, still the horde seemed no smaller, no less avid for food, no might turned aside from its activity of eating and killing whatever prey it chanced upon. Dyke would have to come up with some way to feed those brutes if he was to control them. He felt certain he could win Slayer back with friendship. After all, he'd exposed the beast to fresh, clean meat, his own feet and legs, which he himself had taught Slayer to devour. The mantis was in no way to blame. Dyke would have to remember to smear his protecting paste over any part of him that was washed every time he stepped ashore. If he did that, and if he provided Slayer with the food he needed, the biggest mantis of them all would surely be his friend once more, not biting pieces out of him, but hunching down beside him, eating or sleeping as he'd done in the jungle. He remembered that he'd not checked his fishing line since the storm. 
If the tidal wave left any of them intact, there might be something there for the beast. Usually he had fish to eat and store each time he hauled in his lines. His boy, marking the spot where he'd baited his hooks, was miraculously still there. He pulled in the lines. Fish! There were more fish than he'd ever caught this way before, perhaps washed onto the hooks by the tidal wave or its aftermath. Some were dead, some were dying, many were still alive. And they were sharing the hundred hooks with turtles, sea serpents, even a small shark. Dyke thought, God, I am in luck. Slayer will love me, will go to the isle without harming me after he gobbles up this meal. He flopped the lines onto the deck of the boat, a few hooks at a time, until the whole array of his catch was stretched the length of the craft. He selected a soft-shelled turtle, pulled the hook from its mouth and carried it downstairs to the galley. He unlocked the door and held out his hands to Slayer, the food in his fingers. Instantly the mantis was beside him, taking the turtle, munching it delightedly almost at once extending his clawed hands for more. Dyke motioned the creature to come up on deck, which Slayer did, shoving Dyke ahead of him in his haste to be free from this prison. Dyke headed him towards the big catch, hoping it would be enough to sate the beast's hunger. Slayer ran at top speed when he spied the meal that was strung along the deck for his eating. Tackling one end of the catch, he popped the first fish into his mouth, then the next. In a moment he was gorging himself, and loving the gorging, drinking part of it, but mostly leaving the blood for the new meat that stretched ahead of him. Dyke smiled. So far, so fine. For now. But the catch would not last Slayer past this meal. It was now apparent. What could provide food for Slayer and the others that Dyke planned to make into the army that would wreak his vengeance? Not enough animals could be found in all of Columbia to satisfy the insatiable hunger and thirst of the Malpello mantises. He'd have to carry out the plan he'd dreamed up on the island earlier today. That of feeding mantises to mantises. He'd have to speed up that process, keep them eating each other. If he meant to kill insects for other insects to use as food, he'd have to devise a means to do so. There must be a soft spot in the armour of the green monsters, a place where a bullet from Dyke's gun would penetrate and cripple the beasts, hopefully cause them to roll over in death. Dyke had plenty of ammunition on the boat, deep in an iron cupboard on deck which Slayer had not disturbed which even the storm had not damaged. Limping on his wounded leg was now growing unbearably painful and sending a powerful ache through his whole body. Dyke made his way to the ammunition cache. He pulled the chest to the front of the cupboard and found the shells and powder safe and dry. Here was his means of gaining power over the island monsters by feeding part of them to the other part if he could discover a vulnerable spot in their thick shells. He wished he had cannons, bombs, laser beams, any of the large weapons that present-day armies employed. But he only had his gun, and the bullets that fit it. He sat down beside Slayer, and adjusted his aching leg, studying the beast as he sat munching upon the seafood that Dyke had given him. The armour of a giant mantis was tough, no doubt about it. But there had to be natural creases in the shell, maybe maybe cracks or partitions where a beast could be shot and killed. Then he saw it. It was the one place where such a beast would be unable to carry on if it was shot. It was the spot where the head joined the body. And the top of the belly covering looked soft as well. Dyke moved close beside Slayer and touched the creature's throat. 
the beginning of the armour that protected his abdomen. Yes, God, yes, there was a softness there. Shots made dead centre to the juncture, or into the start of the belly, should tumble a mantis in his tracks, rolling him in the path of the others, who would sustain themselves upon his dead body. He waited until Slayer had devoured the last fish on the long array, knowing that the mantis would not leave his meal until it was completed. Then Dyke spoke the beast's name, softly, affectionately, and Slayer came to him, rubbed against him, and settled down beside him to sleep. But Dyke urged, No, no, Slayer, there's no time for dozing now. We must get to the island and make you the leader of the mantises there. Come, Slayer. Slayer, wake up. Do you hear? The man shouldered a box that held a dozen cartons of shells. The great green monster stirred, shook himself, and finally began to trot beside Dyke towards the end of the boat that touched the land. When the man leapt ashore, so did the mantis. Together they made their way along the beach, pausing only long enough for Dyke to take the bottle of foul-smelling potion from his pocket and rub it on his feet and legs, being careful to smear plenty of it on the bandage that covered his bitten calf. Then the two of them continued their walk towards the throng of monsters that had consumed every last bite of the villagers and were now eating each other, most of them either pursuing or being pursued, killing or being killed, eating or being eaten. Dyke saw a crowd of beasts chasing a smaller group. He raised his gun and aimed at a mantis's soft spot, Firing accurately as he always did, the creature slowed, stumbled, fell, and finally died. Overjoyed at his success, Dyke began to fire again and again, each shot killing a mantis, dropping him to the path of those who desired his belly for their supper. He knew that the beasts were taking note of his gun that they were even waiting their turns for him to kill a running meal for them. He could not have hoped for this much dependence this soon. Beside him, Slayer did not offer to intrude upon the other mantises devouring of their kind. No doubt he was still full from the meal he'd had on the boat, or perhaps he liked being associated with the man with the gun. The power to bring down these monsters, to lay them, at the feet of the hungry ones. Suddenly a beast came up behind Slayer and prodded him forward, raising a claw as if to tear the oversized mantis apart. But Slayer turned and stared at the lesser beast, lowering his head a little and raising his own clawed hands in self-defence, and also in evident intent of murder. The smaller mantis backed away, his eyes bulging even more than usual as he eyed Slayer's bright red head, as scarlet as the blood that was flowing from the beasts being torn apart, a crimson gush that swept the beach and spread into the water. Dyke reached out and patted the red head. Good boy, Slayer. You're the biggest of them all, and the only one with a red head. You will command them as I will command you. The giant insect haunched down beside him, content to be part of Dyke's continued slaughter, of part of the beasts for the sustenance of the others. Aloud, Dyke asked himself, Will Slayer's red head command respect from all the other mantises as it did this one? Will we gain control over the island beasts, at least enough to carry some of them ashore and train them for the trip to Ibak? the journey that will end in the tortured death of Pete Stewart? Will my ammunition hold out long enough to keep the beasts in awe of my gun? And what will I do if it does not?'